Hey Amazon sellers, today we're diving into an exciting challenge that could transform your sales in just 24 hours. I'm calling it the Amazon 24 hour sales boost challenge. Are you ready to see how it works? Let's dive right in. First, let's break down this challenge. We'll tackle eight key parts of your business, giving out three hours to each. By the end of this video, you'll have a plan that you can implement in a full day. Let's get started. Hour one to three, keyword optimization. For the first part of this video, we'll focus on keyword optimization. We'll focus on finding relevant keywords and long tail keywords for your account and where to put them once you find them. Okay, so the first step is finding the keywords that you're gonna be using for this part. The first thing I do is generally just go to a keyword tool like Helium 10 or Jungle Scout. We personally use Helium 10. So I just go to Cerebro and I'll start putting in some of the ASINs that we compete with. I don't have an ASIN for today since this is just an example. So I'm just gonna select one of these ASINs that they already have here for us. And then you can go in and start filtering. So generally what we're trying to do is to filter for keywords that are highly relevant to our product and keywords that aren't too competitive for us to rank for. So over here, the first thing you wanna filter for is search volume. So you want a keyword that doesn't have too low of a search volume and also doesn't have too high of a search volume because if it's getting too many searches, it's probably super competitive and would be very difficult for you to rank on. So generally what I do to fix this is to go to the search volume filter over here. And I add a minimum of around 300. And this depends on how big your product is. And for this product, for example, I can add a maximum of 5,000. If you're in a bigger category, you'd use a bigger maximum and vice versa. If most of your keywords top out at 1,000 or 2,000 searches, maybe this isn't the right filter to use. You can just hit apply filters. And then we're left with 1,900 keywords or almost 2,000 keywords from the initial list of 7,000 that we had. The second thing is filtering for relevancy. So you have two ways of doing this, excluding phrases or including phrases. So generally for including phrases, I'd include phrases that I think are necessary to be there for the keyword to be relevant. So yesterday I was doing some keyword research for a product that was a pet supplement for dogs. So I included the phrases dog, puppy, and canine. And I just excluded any keyword that didn't contain these phrases. Just because if it doesn't include these three phrases, then it's probably not a supplement for dogs. After that, you can also go to exclude. And usually what I do here is I exclude my brand name and the brand name of all of my competitors because I can't include my competitor's brand name in my title, for example, and I'm likely already ranking for my own brand name. So once you add these filters in, you just go in and hit apply filter. And you're generally going to be left with a few hundred keywords, maybe a thousand plus if you're lucky. Now what's up for you to do is to export this data and go through it on Google Sheets and remove any keywords manually that are still not relevant or you still think are too competitive. And you can figure this out based on your category knowledge, plus different things like search volume, suggested PPC bid, and how mature your product is. Because if you have a mature product, you can go after bigger keywords. If you launched yesterday, you're probably not gonna go after a big keyword. So you just filter out anything that you think you won't be able to rank for or anything that you already have or any keywords that are too similar. Because sometimes Helium 10 gives you very similar keywords. Like one is just like a plural and the other isn't or one is just organized in a different way, or one's a misspelling, so you can't use it in your title. So you just filter out anything that you can't use. And after that, you figure out what your final keyword list is, and you move on to the next step. Okay, so now that you have your keyword list ready, the second step is to actually incorporate these into your listing. So you have three places where you can generally put them to get an SEO boost, and these are your titles, bullet points, and backend search terms. Generally speaking, you're going to want to put your best keywords in your title. And by best, I mean the highest potential for ranking, highest potential for producing sales one strength, and also the most visually appealing because some keywords are going to be grammatically incorrect. Some will be misspellings and you don't want to include these in your title. So generally, the second best will be in the bullet points. Since the bullet points are large, you have a lot of room to add keywords. And then finally, the keywords that you can't include on your listing will be put into the backend search terms. And these are, again, bad grammar, misspellings, uh, maybe even keywords in other languages. So Spanish keywords you can't include in your listing because your listing is probably English, unless you sell outside the US and Canada and the UK probably. So anything that you can't include in the titles or bullet points can be added to the backend search terms. And having these keywords in your listing will help you rank, will help you index, and will eventually help you get more sales. Hour four to six, improving product images. Next up, we're going to improve your product images, starting with the main image and then doing the rest of your product listing images. The aim of improving your main image is to improve your click rate, which then brings you more traffic. And then the rest of the product images will help convert this customer. So improved product images increases your CVR and therefore increases your sales. Okay, so I opened up Amazon here so I could show you everything live. 
First thing we're going to discuss is the actual main image. And I have this search results page to actually show you some examples in the wild. The keyword I've searched right now is pet odor spray. I just wanted to show you this brand over here, Angry Orange. So if you look at all of the main images over here on the stop of search section, you'll notice two things. And we're just going to exclude this final one because it's also an Angry Orange product. So we're just going to look at the first three. If you look at these three images, you'll notice two of them are facing the left and they're both white and blue. And then Angry Orange is actually bright neon orange. It has a black spray cap, which isn't the color you see on the other two listings. And it's also facing the right, not the left. So this immediately grabs the attention of the potential customer and makes them more likely to click on Angry Orange. And this is besides the fact that it also has 120,000 reviews, which obviously contributes to people wanting to click on this product. If you look again on the row right after, you'll notice that, again, Angry Orange stands out here. Well, the color is different, the direction it's facing in is different. And if you look at every subsequent row, you'll notice that Angry Orange is really standing out just with the colors and the other stuff that they're using. Again, over here, this is a really good example. Facing the left, the left, the left. Two bottles, bright neon orange, black spray head, all facing the right. This makes the customer very, very likely to click on Angry Orange's products versus any other product on the search results page. The lesson learned from this is to try to change things up with your main image to attract customers. If everyone's product is positioned vertically, position yours with an angle. If everyone just has their product with nothing else on the image, maybe add some of the ingredients next to the product, add like a splash behind the product, add some text or like a fake label on top of the product so it becomes more noticeable. Just try to make your main image stand out and prove to the customer as fast as possible that you're selling what they're looking for. And the quicker you can do that, the more likely they are to click on your product and the more traffic you're going to get subsequently and the better you're going to do. All right, so for our product this thing, there are two things you want to get right. The actual content, which is the messaging and the actual story you're telling the customer and the design. Over here, you can see the design of the angry orange images are pretty good. So you'll see everything here looks pretty clean. Right, and the actual content is good. And the way you make good content is through research. And the way you make good design is either being a good designer yourself, which I'm guessing for the vast majority of people watching the video, you're probably not graphic designers. So the second way you can actually get good content or good design is to hire someone, right? So either hire a copywriter for the content or hire someone for the actual design. Generally, everyone ends up hiring a graphic designer, but if you can put an extra hour of work in, you can actually get away with doing the content yourself and maybe even better than someone else would have done for you. To get good content, you actually have to read the reviews. So generally, I'll just go down to ratings over here. I'll start reading at least 100, 200, 300 reviews. I'll try to figure out the main five reasons someone is buying, right? So what are the main five reasons people are buying? Like what problem are they solving? Why did they buy this product? Why did they like this product? Why did they dislike this product? Who are they? You know, what type of products have they tried before this? What things worked for them? What things didn't work for them? And then based on that, you come up with five buying points and you then turn each buying point into an image. So you'd say like image one is the main image. Image two, for example, is an image about how this pet odor peening spray can do X, Y, and Z. Image three is about how it's pet safe, right? Image four is about how the effect is long lasting or it cleans even the hardest stains and so on. So you have to find five points and then you create five images out of these besides the main image. And then we can actually later use this for the rest of the listing, which we'll cover in this video. Hour seven to nine, the rest of your listings. Okay, so now let's discuss your bullet points and your A plus content. For the bullet points, it's nice and simple. You'll just be using those five points that we found earlier. You'll be turning them into five bullet points. A bullet point consists of two parts, the pre-heading and the actual meat or the content of the bullet point. For the pre-heading, you're just going to try to summarize what the benefit is. So for example, look younger or age slower or whatever it is for your product. And then for the actual content, you explain how the product achieves that. So summary and the actual mechanism of how your product achieves that. You just do this five times and you try to include the keywords from earlier into your bullet points. A plus content is very similar, but a bit more complicated. So I'll open share screen right now and show you what we'll do. So for the A plus content, we'll be making it based on the same five points, but I try to add some more visual aspects to the actual content that we're producing here. So I start with what I call a statement image, which is something like this, where you show off your product and your brand and you're not really talking about any benefits that you have. You could have like a tagline, which includes some benefits or anything that you want people to know about your brand. 
but you're not adding infographics and you're not adding checklists or comparison charts or anything. You're just creating a statement image that looks nice, and then you're gonna start to talk about your actual benefits in the later modules. So after the statement image, I generally go into what I call a three box module, and I basically have three images over here, each of them highlighting a main selling point. And it's just nice and simple. I add the product plus the actual benefit in a title, usually all caps with a big font so people can read it easily. And then I reuse this text as the title under the image. And then I just write some text similar to what we'd have in a bullet point that will explain the mechanism by which the product achieves this. Finally, for the next two images, you're just gonna use the previous points that we found. So the same five points, you can just find some of these points and create images out of them. So for this product, we had the selling point, no weird aftertaste. So I just created an image. I literally said no weird aftertaste, tastes just like the original, because this is like a better for you Oreo. I just created some nice designs out of it. And then I just had this final image and it said, it's you'll never go back better. Because usually people are transitioning from Oreos to this product. So I'm telling them it's so good, they're never gonna want to go back to Oreos again. So that's pretty much it for the A plus content. It's simple. It's just based on the same five points again. But I try to follow this format every time uh, just to make it easy on myself and easy on the designer that we're going to work with. Other than that, it's the same as the images and the bullet points. We're going to be using the same points. We're just going to try to structure it a bit different and focus a bit more on the visual elements. Power 10 to 12, adjusting pricing strategy. All right, it's time to talk money. Let's discuss your pricing. So step number one is to analyze your competition's pricing. So figure out who the top 10 competitors by sales are and create a spreadsheet with all of their prices and your price as well. If you sell something that can be sold by the number of ounces or the number of pills or the number of anything, you're going to want to include that in your pricing. So you could have a price per ounce or a price per package or a price per pill, just so that you have a point of reference. Once you have everything laid out on a spreadsheet, you're going to want to start to compare your sales to the sales of other people that are doing better or worse than you and figure out where their pricing's at. If there are people selling more than you and they're not like a huge brand or they don't have like a ton of reviews, they're still selling more than you and they have a higher price, you might have some room to increase your price. And then if everyone who's selling more than you is selling at a significantly lower price, then maybe your price is too high. So based on this, you want to start mapping out different price sets, like, hey, I need to test this price point, that price point, and this price point. Should ideally have some price points in the increase and decrease direction. Map these out, give yourself two weeks for each price test, and then put these on an Excel sheet and say like, hey, my baseline is this price. This is how much I'm selling on average every two weeks. Then you're gonna test two weeks at each price level and figure out how your sales change at each price point. Ideally, what we're trying to do is to find the price point that's best for sales and for profit. So you're going to find out after you run each two-week test how you performed. You just pick the price where you performed the best. Then you can do micro changes above and below that price to see if you can squeeze out any extra efficiency. And if not, you just keep that price and maybe you start pre-testing prices every four months after that. The final thing to say about this is while you're mapping out the different price tests, you want to be very careful about your margin because some people price too low after seeing that their competitors are priced lower than them and they end up selling at a break-even margin or even a loss margin and they just don't know it because they're not looking at their books and they don't know their numbers. So you have to be very careful with that or else you might lose your entire business. Hour 13 to 15, optimizing PPC campaigns. Okay, now we've gotten to my favorite part, optimizing and improving your PPC campaigns. We have four different things that we're going to look at here. One is reviewing your search term report to find potential keywords and negations. Two is increasing bids on good keywords. Three is decreasing bids on bad keywords. Four is checking campaign budgets. Five is looking for different campaign types, targeting types, or match types that we're not utilizing yet. Okay, so step number one is nice and easy. You're just going to go to Amazon, go to reports, and download the search term report and add it onto a Google Sheet. Once you have it, you're just going to filter for two things. At the start, you're going to filter for search terms with sales above zero that are not an exact match you're going to make a list out of these and make sure you're not already using them on amazon and all match types if you find some match types where you're not using them you'll just go in and add it into campaigns with these match types as keywords and then you're going to expand your targeting footprint and your visibility and potentially get more sales the second thing you're going to want to do is filter for search terms with orders equal zero and order it from highest to lowest in terms of spend if you find any high spend search terms that haven't produced any sales, you're just going to add these as negations in the campaigns where they came from. For steps two and three, we'll be increasing and decreasing bids on keywords based on whether they're above or below our ACOS target. To do this, you're going to go into the targeting tab and you'll add a filter for keywords below your target ACOS. You'll filter for keywords above two orders within the last 30 days, again, depending on the size of your business. And then you're going to increase bids on them by 5%, 10%, however much you want. 
And then you're going to do the opposite. You'll do keywords with more than three orders because you want to be more conservative with the decreases. So keywords with more than three orders at uh, above average ACOTs, I try to do at least 5% above your target. Then we go in and you can do again a 5, 10 or 15% bid drop. This helps you prioritize your ad spend. So it goes towards the keywords that are doing well and away from the keywords that are burning your money. For step number four, we're just going to confirm that we have no good campaigns that are running out of budget. We're just going to add to the budget step under campaign manager as a filter for average time and budget under 100 and ACOS below target. Then we're just going to go in and if there's anything under 100, you're just going to bulk select them and increase their budget by at least 50%. This way they get to spend more and if they're already producing sales at a favorable ACOS, you're going to get more low ACOS sales and you'll be a happy seller. The final thing we're going to do is check for missing campaign types. So if you guys aren't running any of the three ad types, you should start running them. Or if you're running them all, but you're underspending on any one of them, you want to start spending more. If you're not using all three match types equally, you're going to want to add more keywords into any match type that's lacking and increase its bids. If you're not using all of the targeting types, so if you don't have auto, category, product targeting, and manual keyword setup, you're going to want to set these up. For this step, you're just going to make sure everything's set up and everything's performing well. And if it's not set up or not performing well, you're going to have to go in and find out why in the case of it not performing well. If it's not set up, you're just going to have to go and create it for all of your ASINs that you're currently advertising. That's pretty much it. This expands your target zone, right? Or expands your surface area and allows more people to find out about your products and eventually more customers to buy your product. Hour 16 to 18, leveraging social proof. Now let's focus on reviews and ratings. There are two steps to this. One is using Vine and request tool. Vine is nice and easy. If you have any product under 30 reviews and you're a brand registered seller, just enroll it into Vine and you get 30 reviews. There's a small trick that you can use here because if you have multiple variations on a product, you can actually split them all, enroll them into Vine separately, then merge them once all the units are claimed. So instead of having 30 reviews, you could launch with 210 reviews. And immediately have a mature product. The second thing, which you can do for products already above 30 reviews is using a review solicitation tool, which basically just reaches out to customers on your behalf, asking them if they can leave a review for the product that they purchased. With these two methods, you can increase the number of reviews on your listing. In terms of the rating, you're just gonna have to have a good product. If you have a bad product, you're gonna either have to improve it or just get fake reviews from friends and family to kind of pump up the score. And once you have a lot of reviews and they have a very good review score, you should see your ACoS go down, your sales go up, and your CVR also go up. So it's advantageous for all of your metrics. Hour 19 to 21, exploring external traffic. It's time to think beyond Amazon. Most big sellers are using more than one channel to drive traffic. It could be Facebook, Google, TikTok, Influencer, YouTube, anything of the kind, but they're using more than one channel to get some extra market share and drive some traffic that wasn't gonna necessarily buy on Amazon. We're not external traffic experts, but we generally recommend starting with Google just because it's the most similar to Amazon with the whole keyword and pay-per-click dynamic. And then you can explore things like TikTok just because it's a newer platform right now. Advertising is less expensive. And you can get really good conversion rates and really good traffic if you partner with the right influencers and produce engaging content. So definitely explore these two different channels, especially if you are maxed out right now with what you're doing on Amazon and the amount of traffic that you're getting. Hour 22 to 24, analyzing and adjusting. Right now that we're in the final stretch, we're just going to talk about setting up tracking for all of what we just did. So you want to create a sheet which includes all of your main metrics, sales, spend, ACOS, tackles, before all of these adjustments, and then also leave room for the after and start tracking the after maybe three to four weeks after you finished all of the setup. Because realistically, this is going to take you more than 24 hours if you have multiple ASINs. So have a before and then after. And then just track these metrics over time, figure out if these metrics are improving. And also if that profit is improving and try to track everything separately. So if you made like listing changes, figure out if your conversion rate improved. If you made pricing changes, figure out again if your conversion rate improved, if net profit improved, if revenue improved. So you want to have a separate tracker sheet for each change that you made and figure out before and after the change by like a few weeks, if there's any noticeable improvement in any of the metrics that you're focused on improving. So this is the final stretch. You can set up this tracker sheet however you want. Some people are tracking different numbers than others. Just have a good Excel sheet. Maybe hire someone to do that tracking for you if it's not your thing. I don't personally enjoy doing this stuff myself. So you can always find someone to do the tracking for you. Just make sure you have a very clear way of tracking these metrics and an understanding of what's actually driving change and improvement for your business and what's not. Or else all of these changes will be worthless for you. All right, guys, that's it for our 24-hour workday. I hope you guys found this challenge useful. 
If you have any questions, just email me directly at safesaif at aihello.com or reach out at www.aihello.com if you'd rather us do this work for you. Again, hope you guys found this useful and I'll see you again on next week's video. Have a great day.